On May 4, 2007, a textbook tornadic dryline setup would materialize in the Great Plains, and the ensuing outbreak would consist of multiple large tornadoes, most of which after dark. One of these tornadoes would go on to make history, completely destroying the city of Greensburg, Kansas, and becoming the first ever tornado to earn an EF5 rating. Today, we turn back to this fateful day in May and examine the meteorology behind what made it tick. Today, we study the infamous case of the Greensburg tornado. The 2007 tornado season leading up to May had been a season of highs and lows, with the months January through April adding up to an almost perfectly average tornado season up to that point. The first EF4 in US history would happen in Kansas in late February. The very next day featured a large outbreak in the southeast with two more EF4s, one of which struck Enterprise, Alabama, killing nine people. March 28th saw a handful of long-track tornadic supercells in the western plains. From then up to the 4th, the only other notable event to occur was an outbreak sequence from April 20th through to the 27th, which spawned over 90 tornadoes altogether throughout the United States and Mexico, the vast majority of them being weak and insignificant. Fast forward to May 4th. A deep mid-level trough has moved in from the west. It has centered over the Rocky Mountains but has begun to eject over the plains. A surface low forms in western Kansas and draws in warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico toward the plains. A classic spring dryline setup is taking shape. Meteorologists are on high alert. A worrying combination of shear and instability is forecast to come together in the region. The SBC demarcates a level 4 out of 5 moderate risk in parts of Kansas and Oklahoma, highlighting the possibility of all threats, damaging winds, large hail, and strong tornadoes. Surface temperatures are forecast to reach well into the mid-80s, which, combined with the moist air from the Gulf, results in Cape values well in excess of 3,000 joules per kilogram throughout the region. An EML is also present over the plains, which, in addition to increasing Cape, creates a capping inversion to keep storms from initiating before the proper conditions for tornado genesis are in place, as well as keeping storms isolated when they form. In the plains, the low-level jet plays a huge role in tornado setups. The low-level jet, or LLJ, is a fast-moving stream of air about a kilometer above the surface that, when present, causes a substantial increase in low-level shear and storm relative flow both of which are crucial ingredients for tornado development. If other necessary ingredients are in place, a strong LLJ will dramatically increase tornado potential. Famously, the low-level jet is known to strengthen rapidly in the evening in response to a pressure differential caused by higher elevations cooling faster than lower elevations as the sun sets. This effect is most pronounced and most common in the Great Plains. The low-level jet that materialized during the evening of May 4th was particularly strong. Combined with the high stability values and discrete storm mode, this made for a rather potent setup coming together in the plains. This sounding is representative of what the background environment in southwest Kansas looked like that evening. Readily apparent is the large K profile, showing an explosive amount of convective energy in the atmosphere, like a bomb waiting to be set off. Also apparent is the inflated low-level hodograph, thanks in no small part to the screaming low-level jet in place at the time resulting in 0 to 1 km helicity values over 300 units. The SBC issues mesoscale discussion number 685, including parts of western Kansas, Oklahoma, and the Texas Panhandle, anticipating the development of supercells in the area by 6 p.m. The environment is primed. The day has all the makings of a significant severe weather day. The gun is cocked and ready to fire. The first storm fires off the dry line in the Texas Panhandle just before 5 p.m. Less than an hour later, the storm becomes tornado warned after drifting over the state border into Ellis County, Oklahoma. At 6.21 p.m., the first tornado of the day makes its way to the ground near Arnett, Oklahoma. This tornado, filmed by Reed Timmer as well as Val and Amy Castor, among others, is rather remarkable in its own right. The tornado is a high-based, well-lit, photogenic drill bit meandering over rural Oklahoma farmland and not much else, causing no reported injuries or fatalities. Footage of this tornado makes it immediately apparent that it was likely far more powerful than its comparatively low EF1 rating suggests, and that it just didn't hit nearly enough to justify a higher rating. This tornado would prove to be the direct antithesis of a separate, larger tornado that would form later in the evening, the tornado for which this date truly lives in infamy. The time is 6.44 p.m. 
a cluster of small thunder showers began initiating off the dry line over Harper County, Oklahoma. New cells continue to form and move with the cluster as it drifts north into Kansas. The clock approaches 8 p.m. The cells begin to merge and intensify upon crossing over the Kansas border. Their updrafts undergo a consolidation process wherein their strengths essentially combine into one powerful storm. The nocturnal low-level jet is strengthening rapidly, resulting in a dramatic increase in low-level shear. As such, less than 15 minutes later, the storm organizes into a powerful supercell and goes tornado worn. Shortly thereafter, the storm produces its first tornadoes. Four small, brief tornadoes that mostly remain over open country in Clark and Comanche counties. Just before 9 p.m., the storm cycles and develops a powerful new mesocyclone. Train spotters report a funnel cloud, and at exactly 9 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the storm will drop its fifth and most violent tornado. The National Weather Service in Dodge City has issued a tornado warning for Kiowa County in South Central Kansas until 10 p.m. Central Daylight Time. At 9.17 p.m. Central Daylight Time, National Weather Service meteorologists were tracking a confirmed large and extremely dangerous tornado 14 miles south of Greensburg, or 11 miles northwest of Wilmore, moving northeast at 25 miles an hour. Locations impacted include Greensburg and rural residences of eastern Kiowa County. This includes Highway 54 between mile markers 105 and 115. This storm has a history of producing tornadoes causing damage. The safest place to be during a tornado is in a basement. If at a mobile home evacuate to a substantial structure, get under a workbench or other piece of sturdy furniture. If no basement is available, seek shelter on the lowest floor of the building in an interior hallway or room such as a closet. Use blankets or pillows to cover your body and always stay away from windows. This is an extremely dangerous and life-threatening situation. A large tornado has been confirmed. If you are in the path of this destructive tornado, take cover immediately. That is absolute wow. monster wow. violent tornado. Oh, wow. That is a monster. That was a that gas line. Well, that was a gas line. We gotta get out of here. Yeah. Look at the size of that thing. This could be a two-mile wide tornado. Flashes of lightning reveal a monster tornado, a 1.7 mile wide wedge with winds in its core exceeding 200 miles per hour. Initially, its northeasterly track puts it on a path to come dangerously close to, but ultimately miss Greensburg. Unfortunately, just as it approaches, the parent mesocyclone begins to occlude and steers the tornado ever so slightly more to the north, putting it on course for a direct hit. The National Weather Service in Dodge City issues a tornado emergency for Kiowa County. And at 9.45 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the city of Greensburg, Kansas is swallowed whole by the EF-5 tornado. At 10.05 p.m., the tornado finally dissipates in a field northwest of town, but the damage is done. Greensburg is wiped off the map. 95% of buildings in town are completely destroyed. Nearly everyone in town is left homeless. 11 people are killed and 63 are injured. $250 million in damage done. The events that have just transpired will come to change the city's history forever and leave scars persisting for generations. Meanwhile, the parent supercell rages on after continuing northeast. The strong low-level jet helps the supercell persist well after dark, not only by supplying strong low-level shear, but also by advecting moist air northward, which actually increases instability in the near-storm environment as the night goes on. The very next cycle of the storm directly following the EF-5 goes on to produce another monster tornado in the Truesdale area. This one, even wider than the last, is measured at 2.2 miles across making it the second largest tornado ever recorded at the time. The tornado receives an EF3 rating, which is likely a result of it remaining mostly in open farmland. The tornado was almost certainly violent, and some even speculate that it could have been just as strong, if not stronger, than the EF5 that preceded it. After the Truesdale tornado dissipates, yet another large wedge tornado forms north of Haviland and impacts the Hopewell area. This tornado dissipates in the Maxvale area, 
but not before killing one person and doing EF3 damage. The fourth and final large wedge tornado of the night forms near Maxville, again rated EF3. Like the Truesdale tornado, this tornado is also frequently speculated as having much higher winds than this rating suggests, likely being of EF4 or perhaps even EF5 intensity. After this tornado dissipates, the weakening storm goes on to drop a handful of weaker, short-lived tornadoes before the storm itself finally dies several hours later. The next day's sunrise casts light upon a horrific scene in Greensburg. Streets littered, houses gone, trees stripped of their bark. Immediate cleanup efforts were hampered even further by the fact that meteorologists were anticipating an even bigger tornado outbreak that very afternoon, the SPC issuing a rare high risk for the region, with Greensburg included. A large long track DF2 would touch down in Kiowa County, affecting some areas that had been impacted by the previous night's tornado family, and areas closer to Greensburg were threatened by satellite tornadoes associated with this tornado, but the town of Greensburg was ultimately spared from suffering another direct hit. The outbreak on May 5th was the most prolific single-day outbreak in 2007 in terms of count, with over 80 tornadoes being confirmed throughout the plains, putting it up there with some of the more high-end plains outbreaks of the last few decades. Despite this, May 5th's reputation and legacy will forever be overshadowed by the events of the night before. As of today, Greensburg has almost completely bounced back from this tragedy. The city has since rebuilt and has committed to becoming one of the greenest towns in America. All city buildings have been built to lead platinum standards, and the city is now powered via wind turbine. Even many houses have been reconstructed with green and tornado resistant construction, such as ICF. The story of Greensburg's destruction and subsequent rebound lives on as one of the greatest testaments to human resilience ever told. That said, the scars left by the tornado will continue to be visible for generations to come, and the events of the evening of May 4th, 2007, won't soon be forgotten by residents of this small town in southwest Kansas.